वसुदेवसुत कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्णम वंदे जगद्गुरु so we have just started the 13th chapter the 13th chapter of the bhagavad gita is called the um kshetra kshetragya vibhaga yoga the um discernment the yoga of the discernment of the field and the field knower the field and the field knower we did just two verses the first two verses which are very very important you can chant it with me if you like uh, i'll chant and you can follow shri bhagavan uvacha shri bhagavan uvacha idam shariram kaunteya idam shariram kaunteya kshetram ityabhidhiyate kshetram ityabhidhiyate etad yo vetitam prahu प्राहो क्षेत्रेषु भारत सर्वक्षेत्रेषु भारत क्षेत्र क्षेत्र ज्ञानम क्षेत्र क्षेत्र ज्ञानम यज्ञानम मत मम यज्ञानम मत मम द ब्लेसेड लॉर्ड सेड दिस बॉडी ओ सन ऑफ कुंती इज कॉल्ड द क्षेत्र द फील्ड एंड दैट विच इज कॉन्शियस ऑफ इट विच इज अवेयर ऑफ इट विच नोज इट इज कॉल्ड द क्षेत्र Uh, the knower of the field who is it called who who calls this uh, says uh, those who are masters of this knowledge and then in the second verse he goes on to say and know the embodied self in all beings the kshetragya in all beings in all bodies kshetras to be myself o prince of the bharata clan that i am the knower of the field in all these fields the this knowledge of the kshetra and kshetragya is in my opinion true knowledge so these these are the two verses why are they so important and what are we going to do about it now so as uh, shankaracharya last time i mentioned i'm going to spend some time a uh, couple of classes maybe we will talk about what uh, adi shankaracharya in his masterful commentary on the bhagavad gita what he has said about this verse uh, he has written an extensive commentary the longest commentary of any verse especially the second verse the one we just we just read now the longest commentary of any verse in the whole bhagavad gita the second verse in the big book that is uh, shankara's com- commentary shankara bhashya uh i was counting 11 12 pages 12 pages for this one verse the second verse so what has he said there why is it so important what he does there he raises many questions delves deep into it and it might get pretty subtle and difficult but the point there is it uh, it clarifies our understanding of non duality of advaita vedanta he takes this opportunity these two verses to teach and clarify uh, what non duality is what does it mean shankara's commentary i will read just parts of it i won't read through it line by line just parts of it the first sentence he says don't bother about the sanskrit i'm reading it for my benefit and for those of you who want to hear shankara's language um I remember the way I got started on this on reading the commentary was when I was a novice a brahmachari one of the senior monks asked me uh, when we were discussing this he asked me 
you haven't read Shankara in the original? I said, no, I keep looking at translations because I think uh, it must be difficult, you know, read Shankaracharya's own writings must be difficult. He said, on the contrary, Shankara's Sanskrit is one of the simplest. Let's remember, he was a teenager when he was writing this. <laughs> he was a kid. So Shankara's uh, Sanskrit is one of the simplest, most direct. Uh, so try it, try it yourself, you'll start understanding. Of course, you have to know some Sanskrit to understand it. And I did try it, and I did understand it. <laughs> I, and I came to love reading Shankara directly. So, um, some of Shankara's own language. One of his sub-commentators, Vachaspati Mishra, praises Shankara's expression, his language, his writing, as uh, Prasanna Gambhira. Very uh, bright, Prasanna is bright, lucid, luminous, but Gambhira is deep and profound. Both very, very open, simple, direct, and yet it runs very deep. So we'll see. The first sentence he writes is, Kshetragyam yathokta lakshanam chapi maam parameshwaram asamsarinam vidhi janihi. What does it mean? Knower of the field. Remember, this is the commentary on the second verse. So, knower of the field, as has been explained, know that to be me, the Supreme Lord, God, uh, who is transcendental. That's it. It basically seems to be a paraphrase of the uh, second, you know, the first line of the second verse. What did uh, Krishna say? Kshetragyam chapi maam vidhi sarva kshetri shubharata. O Bharata, O Arjuna, know me to be the um, knower of the field in all these fields. In each field, there is a knower of the field. But all of these fields, there is only actually one knower of the field. Contrary to what one might feel. It's counterintuitive. One might feel that uh, every body has, has a separate sentient being. That's what we feel like. There are so many people here, we feel that. And Krishna flat out contradicts that. He said, if you really know what's going on here in depth, there's only one being here, one consciousness, and I am that, ultimately, ultimately. Practically, of course, we are many people. And Shankara simply seems to um, repeat that. He says, Yatokta Lakshanam, as has been indicated. What do you mean, as has been indicated? For this, we have to go back to the first verse. The first verse, what did it say? Krishna said, in all these bodies, there is a knower of the body. The body is called the field, and the knower of the body is called the knower of the field. The conscious being who is aware of this body. That's us. That's where it begins. Because that's, we, that's where, how we feel, you know. If we really look at ourselves right now, yeah. we'll feel like I am this embodied self. I am this conscious being in this body. Yeah. I am in some sense this body also, but also I'm not literally bones and skin and hair is something conscious about me, something aware about me, sentient about me. That's what we think. Now, he uses this, this, this uh, idea of the knower of the body as a lever to discern the real nature of the self from the apparent self, from what we seem to be um, with what we truly are. Discern, I said, um, because the analysis which we will, I will just quickly summarize what we did last time, the analysis. It seems like we are separating ourselves from the body-mind. But the idea is not to separate ourselves from the body-mind. Remember, Vedanta is not a, not, it does not teach difference. It ultimately aims to teach oneness. So what it is doing is, this method which we will, I will recapitulate quickly, it is making us discern, understand who or what we truly are. What we think we are to what we truly are. What we think we are is this, I am this conscious being in this mind and this mind, this body, this awareness, this bundle is what I think I am. I was born at such and such time and I have been aging and I guess I will die at some, so some point. This is my life story. I am this, this sentient being, this human being, this aware being. Uh, there's a word for it in Sanskrit, jiva. Jiva, a sentient being. That's what I think I am. And that's the meaning of Shetragya. That's the direct meaning of Shetragya, knower of the field. But, then remember, the whole process we went through last time. The knower of something is different from what it knows. So, 
if you are aware of something, you are different from what you are aware of. The simple example which we took up last time was the eye which sees is distinct from what it sees. So I can see whatever I can see in this room, they, they, all those things are different from the eye. The seer and the seen are different. The knower and the known, the subject and the object, the knower of the field and the field must be two different entities. Simple enough. Then we went a little more deeper. Remember, we considered the eye itself. Am I aware of the eyes? Am I conscious? Uh, do I know that my eyes are open? Eyes are closed? Eyes are itching? I need glasses? Things like that. Hmm? Yes, we are conscious. Especially when you go to the eye doctor. And they'll just tell you. Uh, so we are, we are conscious of it. If we are um, conscious of it, if you are aware of it, then I, the one who is aware of my eyes, I cannot literally be the eyes themselves. So we know, yeah, I know, uh, the mind is aware of the eyes. And the mind and the eyes are different. Eyes are this kind of sense organ. The mind is whatever it is, a thinking uh, uh, instrument or thinking entity. So it's different from the sense organ called the eye. That's clear enough. Then we consider the, and not only that, the mind is aware of not only the eyes, it's aware of the ears and the nose and the ent entire body, in fact. Then we consider the mind itself. Are we aware of the contents of the mind? Are we, can we know the, uh, the thoughts that we have, the feelings that we have? Of course you say. Of course we are aware of our own feelings. If it hurts, I feel it. It hurts. That's, that's the meaning of the sentence. It hurts. It's ridiculous to say that it hurts, but I don't know it. it it's self-contradictory. If it hurts, I know it. Of course, the first thing that I know is, ouch, it hurts. <laughs> so if I know the contents of the mind, then a remarkable thing, using that lever, knower of the no field, the mind also becomes the field, it is known. Then the knower of the field, you who are aware of the contents of your own mind, you cannot be literally the mind. We are not minds. There are minds. We are not bodies. There are bodies. But we are that which is aware of the mind-body complex. And we operate through the mind-body complex. But this is a, what Swami Ranganathananda used to call Vedantic thought bomb. He drops a thought bomb on us that uh, we are not these bodies and minds. I remember reading 2013, there was a nice article in the Wall Street Journal, the man who bought yoga to the West. And it's Swami Vivekananda. It was about Swami Vivekananda. Um, and then the, the journalist writes that all those enthusiasts who are st stretching in their yoga pants might be today surprised to know Vivekananda is saying, you are not bodies. The whole yoga here is stretch, bend. It's good, but you are not bodies. And they may, might be even more surprised and mystified to know that he taught, you are not minds. Why not? Here, the knower is different from the known. Clearly you know, you experience your own bodies and minds. Therefore, you are not the body, not the mind. We are not bodies. We are not even minds. We are not physical entities in reality, at the bottom. We are not physical entities. We are not even mental beings. Contrary to what we, without question, we assume. What is it that we, we assume without any question, without any hesitation? We are persons. What's a person? Basically a thinking, feeling, emotional being, uh, intellectual, emotional being in a body, in a physical body. That's what we think a person is. And now we are seeing, not only being told, we are seeing for ourselves. It's, a, it's possible that in a certain sense, I am not literally the body or the mind. The body is there, the mind is there, but I'm not literally the body. No more than if I wear a cloth, I'm not the cloth. And if I wear inside this cloth a shirt, I am not the shirt. Similarly, the body and mind are like physical covering and a mental covering to the conscious being which I am, the being of awareness, the knower of the field. He just calls it the knower of the field. And then the consequent the, the implications. Yeah. Uh, the, if I am not one thing, then the characteristics of that, that thing are not my characteristics. Let me repeat. Uh. The characteristics of something belong to it. If I am not X, then the properties of X are not my properties. 
So X, the body, it ages, it's born, it ages, it uh, deteriorates, it dies. That's the actual meaning of the word, Sanskrit word sharira. That which ages, deteriorates and perishes. Very positive. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, if, if that, those are the properties of the body, but if I'm not the body, then they are not my properties. Being born and aging and deteriorating and dying cannot be my properties. And they are properties of the body. Going through ups and downs, terribly unhappy, depressed, enthusiastic, eager, joyful, uh, waking, dreaming, sleeping. These are all characteristics of the mind. If I am not the mind, then being frustrated, unhappy, depressed, um, you know, excited, um, tense, angry, all of those are not my properties. They are properties of the mind. I mentioned that monk who put it so nicely in Hindi. What is Vedanta? How do you apply Vedanta? Jo cheez jaha ka hai Mahatma ji, usko wahi rehne do. Keep places, keep things where they belong. Don't misplace things. Pain, yes pain is there, but not yours. Where is the pain? Pain is in the body. Unhappiness, frustration. Yes, you're not going to deny it. You felt it. If you felt it, you are the knower of the frustration. In the mind. It belongs in the mind. Let it stay in the mind. It's not you. You are aware of it. No more than if you are aware of a very frustrated character, unhappy character, depressed character coming on the movie screen. You are not that. You are aware of it. You, you even sympathize with it, but you are not it. You were there before it. You were there watching it. You were there after it. Similarly, all feelings, emotions, good or bad, pleasant, unpleasant, you are the watcher of that. And even further, the whole of the waking experience, this, the whole of the dream experience, the whole of the deep sleep experience, and again the waking, all are mind, 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 mind. You are the ever awake watcher, witness of waking, dreaming, deep sleep. You are that waker who knows no sleep. You say, oh Swami, you don't know me. <laughs> like that little boy who got a math problem in his class, arithmetic problem in his class. Tell me, if your um, dad borrows uh, $10 and then he uh, uh, returns uh, $5, how many more dollars does he have to return? Uh, how many more dollars will he return? And the little boy said, um, none. And the teacher said, what? You just don't know basic arithmetic and the boy immediately said, you don't know my dad. <laughs> yeah. A more updated New York version of that. The little boy was uh, given this thing, you know, that Tim has um, one dollar and then his mom gives him one more dollar. How much does he have? And the boy bursts out laughing, two dollars? He's broke. <laughs> Tim is broke. <laughs> He's a very, very New York kid. So they belong to the, to the body, the whole waking, dreaming, deep sleep. You are the unsleeping, unwinking, observer, illuminer, observer in the sense not that you are some little person sitting in the mind and watching everything. You are just that light in which this whole thing takes place. That's what we are. The Aurobindo, when he got his enlightenment, his, ex his breakthrough experience, he speaks of the, 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 the glare, the white glare of an immortal eye, he says, an immortal gaze, the world drowned in an immortal gaze. What is that immortal gaze? It's not even your gaze. You are that gaze. We are that, Im that immortal light. And that's the conclusion of the first verse. All of this is the first verse. You are the knower of the field. The body is the field and you are the knower. What about the world? And that's also the field. But particularly this body because with the world we have no confusion. At no point do I say, I see the table and I am the table. I never say that. 
Thank God. But I always say, I see the body. I see it, hear it, smell it, taste it, touch it. Every uh, one of the five organs, sense organs operates on the body. But I see this very strange thing. I am this body. I mean, I don't say it out loud. I just say, I claim this, this is who I am. What's this? It's, it is I. Who are you? What are you? I am this. And we not only say it, we, don't, we behave accordingly and we feel. We feel that's what we are. So this is a way of investigating, discerning what we are truly. It seems like you are being separated from body-mind. But the point is to see that we are the witness, the consciousness in which we experience ourselves as minds and bodies, as mental and physical. Is this enough for enlightenment? And Shankaracharya asks this question before the second verse begins. He says, is this enough for enlightenment? Shankaracharya says, no. No. And Krishna, that's why Krishna goes on to the second verse. And you remember the questions which Krishna answers with the second verse. The two, two que big questions, dramatically answered. That um, how many knowers of the field are there? Yes, all right, I, I'm consciousness and I'm, I'm not the body, not the mind. But then there are so many bodies here and presumably so many minds. So there must be so many consciousnesses. That's one question. How many are there? And the second one is what about God? You haven't mentioned God here yet. So the triangular uh, world view of all religions, theistic religions, the world, sentient beings like us and God. God, world and individual being. Ishwara, Jiva, Jagat. So what about God? You have been talking about this is not the self. The world is the fee, world, body, these are field and I am the knower of the field. Okay, got it. But what about God? You haven't mentioned God yet. And Krishna answers both of these questions in half a verse. Kshetragyam chapi imam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. Know me alone to be the knower, the consciousness in all these bodies and minds. There is only one consciousness. Consciousness is that singular which does not have a plural. Who said it? He said Krishna. No. <laughs> this is, I am quoting Heisenberg. Consciousness is that singular which does not have a plural. Um, Krishna here says, that singular, that one consciousness in all bodies and minds, I am. There is only one consciousness and that I am. What about this world? If you follow, if you followed so far, what he has done is, he has shown us that we are consciousness, we are not the body, not the mind. Now. In one sense, then we have differentiated ourselves from mind and body and the world. So the world is not the self, the body is not the self, the mind is not the self. The self is I just existence consciousness, being awareness, isness, shiningness, let's say. This is who I am. Um, then what about these minds? What about the body? What about this entire vast world? Vedanta will say, um, because Brahman, God, that one consciousness with the power of Maya projects this world. Brahman or God is supposed to be the cause and the world is supposed to be the effect. That which is the cause, it itself appears as the effect in another form. In Sanskrit, Karana and Karya. The clay itself appears as the pot. The wood itself appears as this table. Wood is the material cause of the table. And when you make the table, where is the wood? Here. Yeah, touch wood. When you, when you make a, a potter makes a, a pot out of clay. Where is the clay? In there itself, in, in the pot. So if God has made the universe out of himself, herself, itself. Where is God then? Here itself. Here in this universe, right here. So therefore, uh, according to Vedanta, this world which you have separated from ourselves as the field is actually none other than that pure consciousness. It's appearing as this field. It is projected from this field. But then you add to this this idea that pure consciousness, Brahman, Atman, whatever, that cannot change. That is not subject to modification. But this world is continuously changing from the Big Bang to today. In individual cases, this body, from birth to middle age to old age and death, everything is changing in this world. Nothing is at rest. And yet we say, it must be nothing other than God's stuff, what, what is, this world is made of. But then also you are stipulating 
you means the upanishads and in fact every religion that god cannot change god is beyond limitations god is beyond modification god is beyond you know increase and decrease in that case put them together god is the god or brahman we use the term brahman brahman is the cause of this universe karana in sanskrit the universe is the effect the product of of uh, brahman karya in sanskrit but brahman cannot change and this universe is continuously changing so the only way that this continuously changing imperfect being born changing dying universe the only way it could be god it could be brahman is it it's it has to be an appearance of brahman it can't literally be a changing brahman and uh, uh, you know with all its evil and impurities and wars and destruction and, and so on and so forth how can if you say literally this is god the pantheistic those who are interested in philosophy the pantheistic idea the problem of with pantheism the pantheism says everything here is god chairs tables people ants um, um stars and planets and quarks and quasars all are just god it sounds good but it immediately runs headlong into huge problems because this is a world infected with change it's a world infected with impurity disease death evil cannot run away from the fact that there is serious evil here now if this is literally god then first of all uh, what use is such a god who has become this awful world second um, a simpler more direct objection to the pantheistic conception is that uh, what you are doing in pantheism you're just taking this universe and giving it a new name god you're not making you're not telling us anything new you're saying just saying yes these people tab- tables chairs planet stars uh, dogs and cats and earthquakes and what not whatever you see as world yes that's god Well, what have you what new thing have you said you've just used a new term for it you haven't shown me anything new or greater or better not even a new idea just called it god so this this idea will not fly what krishna is saying what vedanta says is this universe is an appearance of the ultimate reality the reality is brahman the appearance thereof is this universe this is the great doctrine in advaita vedanta of brahma satyam jagat mithya Brahman is the reality world is an appearance appearance of that reality all of this what i just said till now shankaracharya said in three or four words kshetragyam yathokta lakshanam as has been discussed <laughs> that knower of the field he says Paramesh maam chaapi maam parameshwaram asamsarinam vidhi know that to be me god because i have said i am all of them but he adds here a word asamsarinam transcendent beyond samsara crucial point i will um, uh, try to uh, extract from it what is meant here to put it straight away those who understand vedanta those who have been studying vedanta what he has just said is this statement of krishna kshetragyam chaapi maam vidhi sarva kshetre shubharata no me to be the knower of the field in all fields he has just said um shankaracharya has just said that this is a maha vakya a statement of the state great statements of identity i am brahman you are that this is this is the meaning how so parameshwaram asamsarinam a transcendent god but in my transcendent nature what is the transcendent nature of god of brahman nirguna brahman pure consciousness satchidananda existence consciousness bliss then if you say is there a samsari version of god can god be samsari we understand as jeevas we are involved in this world implicated in this world samsari can god be samsari what is meant by asamsarinam is god in its brahman in its nature as pure being pure consciousness pure bliss satchidananda otherwise god involved with samsara is god plus maya brahman plus maya saguna brahman the distinction between brahman with attributes brahman without attributes let me put it in another way what was done in the first verse we were shown 
that I'm not the body, not the mind. And why I'm not the body and mind, all the discussions were done, done last time. He just says, as discussed. <laughs> so I am not the body, I am not the uh, mind, I am the witness consciousness, I am Sakshi, witness consciousness, I am pure awareness. And exactly the same thing has to be done to God. As we de- reconstructed ourselves, I am not the physical body, I am not the subtle body, I am not the causal body. Stula, sukshma, karana, sharira, vyatirikta, atma in Sanskrit. The dist- the witness self distinct from the causal, subtle and physical bodies. Again, I am not talking metaphysical gobbledygook, you know. Uh, so, uh, this physical body, this is the, the public one which everybody can see, this is the physical body. The subtle body is what we experience right now, all of us, nothing esoteric about it. When we look inside, when we experience, turn our attention inside, we feel emotions. Ideas, memories, sense of ego, all of that is the subtle body. It includes the mental sheet, the intellect sheet, the pranic sheet, pranamaya, manomaya, vijnanamaya, all of these, it's called the subtle body. And you can divide further. Upanishads talk about 19 aspects or parts of the subtle body. But it's all talking about something that we are experiencing right now. Nothing very fancy about it. It's just fact just like this body similarly a subtle body and the causal body seems uh, even more uh, strange but it's it's basically a seed form of the subtle body which we also experience every night when we fall asleep when we go into a state of where subject and object are merged into one blankness that's the subtle body a causal body apart from the causal body apart from the subtle body apart from the physical body As the witness of the causal, subtle and physical bodies, I am the Atman, the consciousness, then what is called knower of the field. Similarly, do the same thing with God. God also has a physical body, a subtle body and a causal body. What is the physical body of God? 11th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, this universe, the cosmos. Vishwarupa Darshana, 11th chapter. The cosmic uh, uh, experience, the cosmic vision of God. This cosmos is the physical body of God. What is the subtle body of God? The cosmic mind. You say the Hiranyagarbha level, cosmic mind. All minds put together, all subtle bodies put together. All the vital energies, all our thoughts, ideas, feelings, um, knowledge, all of it put together is called the cosmic mind of which our minds are little little bubbles in an ocean. And the causal body of God. What is the causal body of God? The causal body of God, anyone? Ishwara, Ishwara. Ishwara is God. Uh, what's the causal body? Brahman. Brahman is God. Saguna Brahman. Somebody was saying it. Maya. Maya, yes. Maya. Maya. Those who have done Vedanta Sara. They, have known, they know these, uh, this framework. It's a kind of framework that has been sort of set up in post Shankara Advaita. Consciousness plus one causal body, uh, Ajnana, Vyashti Ajnana, is what we are in deep sleep. The same consciousness, Chaitanya, with one uh, causal body and one subtle body, is what we are in our dreams. The same consciousness with one causal body, one subtle body, and one physical body. Don't look mystified. I'm just talking about you right now, right now. What are you? You are that limitless consciousness, apparently limited by one causal body, one subtle body and one physical body. Here, this, here. And what is God? The same consciousness, pure consciousness, limited by the totality of all causal bodies, maya, and more than that also. Limited by further, all minds, world, universe-wide web of minds, <laughs> like World Wide Web, www, like that, is um, uh, the, the one, the, the causal, the subtle body of God. And the physical uh, uh, cosmos, that is the physical body of God. Remember, at the end of the cycle of creation, the physical body and subtle body all merge back into the causal body. It's like deep sleep for God. And then again it emerges when a new universe is created. So this is the cosmology. And if you take God to be just consciousness, quite apart from the cosmos, quite apart from all the cosmic mind, quite apart from Maya, just consciousness itself. Just like you are taking yourself to be just consciousness itself. 
then what happens just consciousness itself on this side your side and just consciousness itself god side they are one and the same thing that's what krishna means by saying no me to be the one consciousness in all beings all of this one word parameshwaram asamsarinam vidhi <laughs> deconstruct god set god free from the limiting adjuncts these are called in sanskrit upadhis of the cosmic body cosmic mind and cosmic causal body and see that god is satchidananda or, or Ch- chaitanya let's say pure consciousness set yourself free from the constricting limits of one body one mind and one causal body and see yourself as limitless consciousness chaitanya those two are one and the same those two are one and the same this is the meaning of the second verse this is the meaning of the second verse second time i'm explaining the whole thing third time one more time uh, this is all different ways of putting it this time i will put it uh, from the vedanta sar or the the analysis of the great sentence mahavakya inquiry into the mahavakya what is the meaning of the great sentence Now, this will make sense to only those who have studied vedanta sar or mahavakya in some some forum in some course remember we talked about two kinds of meaning direct meaning and implied meaning vachyartha lakshyartha in sanskrit vachyartha lakshyartha direct meaning or the dictionary meaning and the way we normally use it and the implied meaning now when the, when he says krishna says kshetragya the knower of the field in all bodies there is there is knower of the field the direct meaning of it is exactly what we take ourselves to be right now when i say you when i when we talk about a person what does that person take himself or herself to be takes take yourself as the whole thing as this uh, body and the personality the mind and yes if you insist consciousness also <laughs> so consciousness mind body all of it together is the direct meaning of the term kshetragya knower of the field and the implied meaning in sanskrit lakshyartha which is arrived at after the analysis the whole analysis which we did the implied meaning is pure consciousness and when you come to parameshwara paramatma ishwara bhagavan saguna brahman all of them mean the same thing god when you come to that the direct meaning of this term saguna brahman uh, you know paramatma the direct meaning would be uh, direct meaning of the word brahman for example would be god pure consciousness plus maya which is the creator preserver destroyer of this entire universe and the vachyartha the lakshyartha the implied meaning of that would be consciousness itself yeah. quite apart from this universe cosmic mind and quite apart from maya just pure consciousness itself satchidananda chaitanya and therefore the implied meaning of kshetragya yeah. uh, that's where the jiva and ishvara become one that's where krishna can say i am the one consciousness in all am i krishna yes implied meaning direct meaning i means sarva priyanand this guy no you're not krishna not at all hmm. this uh, may seem little difficult to wrap our minds around but those who have studied vedanta it's just straight forward um, analysis of the mahavakya the great sentences all right so what it means kshetragyam yathokta lakshanam mam chaapi mam parameshwaram asamsarinam vidhi no the knower of the field as discussed as discussed means pure consciousness parameshwaram asamsarinam god transcendent god transcendent means pure consciousness to be the same you are brahman that's the meaning now there is one more little addition here very interesting addition what one might call a cute addition <laughs> but very important also this is not done by shankara acharya it's done by a sub commentator called anandagiri as a monk who did not comment on the gita but he wrote commentaries on shankara acharya's commentaries so whatever shankara acharya explained he explained it further <laughs> so he has got extensive commentaries on shankara's commentaries what he does with this the word also if you literally uh, see what krishna said kshetragya the knower of the field god is also the knower of the field 
Krishna is saying, I, God, am also the knower of the field. If you put it that way. If you add that also with Kshetra if you leave it where it stands, now that can create serious trouble. Listen to this sentence. I, God, am also you. Also you means? That means other than you. Yes. Not only you, oh, oh Arjuna, but him and him and all of them. But also these um, animals and uh, elephants and horses and all you know, in the battlefield. Uh, and yes, and also um, the whole insentient universe, they are all me. They are all parts of me. What is it beginning to sound like? Vishishtadvaita, qualified monism of Ramanujacharya, you know. So there is one organic uni unity in this entire universe, which is God. God is also you, and him, and her, and all of this, and the chairs and tables, they are also, all of that is God. That's not what Advaita Vedanta wants to say. Advaita Vedanta wants to say there is only pure consciousness, and you are that pure consciousness. So, Anandagiri says, this also should be connected to Maam. Shetragyam Maang Chapi Vidhi. You should know. The first verse, what did you know? I am not the body, not mind, I am pure consciousness. In the second verse, what do you know? You are, this pure consciousness is Brahman also. So therefore, Jiva and Brahman, the sentient being and God, in their transcendent nature, are one and the same thing. So the identity Tattvamasi, you are that. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. It works when you shift the also to the, uh, to connect it with Maam, with me, with God. Can you do that? You can. In Sanskrit, it's open. You can connect these with uh, any one of the terms. So this, it's a subtle point, but very important point. If you have also on this side, it becomes qualified monism. If you have also on that side, it becomes non-dualism. So that's the point that Anandagiri raises. Moving on. <laughs> then Shankaracharya goes on. Sarva kshetreshu yah kshetragya brahmadi stamba paryanta aneka kshetra upadhi viprabhivaktaha tam nirastha sarva upadhi bhedam sadasadadi shabda pratye agocharam vidhi iti abhipraya. What's the point that Krishna wants to make? Abhipraya, purport. The point that Krishna wants to make. Shankaracharya says, in all these fields, what are all these fields? He says, Brahma di Stamba Paryanta, Aneka Kshetra. From the highest God, small g God, Brahma, all the gods in the, the heavens and the, you know, all the um, uh, heavenly beings and earthly beings like us and hellish beings and whoever there is in this universe. And this, this is also in all these beings, as if divided. Upadi Krita, he says, Aneka Upadi Prabhivakta, as if divided by the presence of these bodies and minds. Just like if you have lots of pots, small pot, big pot, thin pot, round pot, all of those, if you put them, and then you look at the space, the space seems to be affected by the pot. More space is included in this pot, less space in that pot. It, but it, that's not true at all. Because space is undivided by the parts. Space is one undivided space. Similarly, by the presence of bodies. See, this is what a beautiful way of putting it. By the presence of these bodies and minds. By the field. By the presence of these fields. Field includes physical body, subtle body, causal body. Because of the presence of these fields, that one consciousness appears to have been divided into millions and billions of sentient beings. All of us. We are one reality. What an amazing thought. But we seem to have been divided into a hundred, into a million, a billion. And you take all kinds of living beings, from the tiniest to the largest, all of us. This division is because of the body, physical body, subtle body, causal body. Apparently. It's not a real division. Just like space cannot be divided by you know, making lots of parts. It just seems to be like that. Similarly, consciousness cannot be divided, no matter how many bodies and minds you generate. They just seem to be different. But then you can have a lot of fun. 
you can have samsara <laughs> you can have this world beautiful world of ours uh, with all its huge uh, wonderful things and even more terrible things all of that can happen one consciousness by itself couldn't do it but one consciousness projecting itself as so many in in so many bodies and minds as billions of entities can have a roaring good time of it <laughs> so brahma adi stambha paryanta from brahma the highest god to stambha so in sanskrit the two words stambha and stambha so if you don't know sanskrit there's no problem if you know sanskrit it might cause confusion at till for a long time i used to think he he means from brahma down to a pillar stambha means pillar but that's not what stambha means stambha the word means the tiniest most insignificant living creature often it's um, it means a blade of grass from the amazing tremendous great god brahma god means small g not brahman to a tiny blade of grass all of them are actually that one limitless consciousness appearing to be many and the many are not equal some are extraordinarily powerful amazing full of power and intelligence and some are let us look at human beings they seem to be very different some are tremendously talented some are very in, uh, intelligent some are um, very dynamic successful uh, some are, uh, are maybe physically ill mentally incapacitated some are uh, such so many varieties among us and what a what a message of vedanta we are all one limitless spiritual being doesn't matter what we are at the physical level doesn't matter what we are at the mental level that does not touch our spiritual nature we are all one being and one limitless absolutely perfect being at the level of manifestation these manifestations keep changing that's the game we are playing yeah. what a tremendous and then he goes on to say nirasta sarva upadi bhedam but if you but what is this one pure consciousness if you let go of all bodies minds uh, by itself what is it by itself that ultimate reality brahman natman whatever you call it knower of the field what is it exactly he says sadasa dati adi shabde pratyaya agocharam vidhi you cannot apply any description to it it's beyond language sadasat means here in this context literally it means existing and non existing but literally in this context it means cause and effect manifest and manifest effect this world cause god with maya so the world is manifest the cause of this world is unmanifest is invisible to us neither is that cause um, the real nature of brahman nor is this effect the real nature of brahman the ultimate reality what we truly are you cannot describe it in terms of manifest unmanifest cause effect no it's beyond our language is it useless to talk about it no it is you it cannot be described known by any mind any any linguistic description then then what's the point point is it's you you know yourself you know that you are but not in the sense of describing it in language or theories or uh, you know uh, or binding it in concepts beyond that then he goes on to say this is knowledge krishna says this is real knowledge shankaracharya backs it up he says here this is true knowledge what is this true knowledge after all here he says यस्मात् क्षेत्र क्षेत्र ईश्वर यथात्म्य व्यतिरेकेण न ज्ञानगोचरम अन्यत अवशिष्टमस्ति अदर देन द नॉलेज ऑफ दिस यूनिवर्स ऑफ यू एंड गॉड जीव जगत ईश्वर दैट्स द ट्रायंगल दैट्स द पैराडाइम व्हिच ऑल दिस रिलीजियंस हैव दैट देयर इज दिस वर्ल्ड द नॉट सेल्फ अदर देन यू एंड देयर इज द सेल्फ यू एंड देयर इज सम पावर बिहाइंड इट ऑल गॉड सो नॉलेज real knowledge would be what the real nature of god the real nature of this universe and the real nature of myself that's real knowledge i'll repeat that what is real knowledge ultimate knowledge final you really know what's going on here if you knew who you are what all this is and what god is if you knew all of that and this is where it has been shown that you are this pure consciousness and that pure consciousness alone is god 
And this universe is a projection of that pure consciousness, nothing but that pure consciousness. Now you know it. Now you know it. And he says, this is knowledge. Krishna says, this is real knowledge. Everything else is a limitation of this knowledge. If you know the world as an object by investigating it part by part, that's science. If you know about other worlds and you know what happens after death, heaven and God, that's religion. If you investigate the body carefully, meticulously, that's medical knowledge of the physical body. If you do analysis of the mind and its various problems and prospects, that is psychology. But underlying all of that, all of this is an appearance of one underlying reality, a spiritual reality, which Vedanta says you are. So this is the greatest knowledge that there is. This is the saving knowledge. This is the final knowledge. What, what more could be there? What more can be there beyond the final oneness, identity? It shows you in what sense this world, you and God are one reality. In what sense? It, it, it clarifies this. He says, there is nothing left to know. What else is there left to know? Yes, but I want to, um, that particular, you know, why that cell behaves in that way in the liver. I want to know that. That you get your NIH grant and do research and find out, you will get, you'll get some understanding of it. Isn't that knowledge? Yes, of course it is knowledge. It's not denying it. That's relative knowledge. And that's useful. That's certainly useful. But this is deeper. And this is like final. After knowing this also you can go. Somebody said, after knowing this can I pursue science? Of course you can. You can pursue science. You can pursue art. You can pursue um, religion. And why can? You should. We are, uh, so next Tuesday you will meet a most remarkable monk. He is one of, uh, he's our, a monk of our order, but he's also a leading mathematician. So he does both. He, he comes to these places, he's now in Toronto, he's going to come to New York um, tomorrow in the night. Uh, and he's going to give talks on, on topology. But I, I said that, see, you're coming here, you have to give a talk on spirituality also. So we have this class on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna on Tuesday. So you have to give this talk on that. And he said, I was afraid of this. <laughs> but he finally, <laughs> he agreed. Yeah. So I asked him once, the traditional Advaitic idea of science and everything else that's done in the world, engineering and medicine and everything, it's all part of the transactional world, the relative world, and it's all right, it works there. But only Advaita Vedanta gives you knowledge of this, this, this real knowledge. What Krishna just said, this is ultimate knowledge. The, the realization that I am this limitless consciousness, which appears as this individual being, as this world, and as God also. So only Advaita Vedanta tells you that. And he told me, no. Um, notice, your Advaita Vedanta is also very much part of the relative world. That's After all, this, this is where we are, in this relative world. And if this can form a bridge between you here and that ultimate reality, Brahman, then it's possible to build a bridge between the relative world and Brahman. After, after all, there are not two worlds. There's only one reality. So he says, one day even, who knows, science may develop to the point where we can actually get insights into uh, ultimate reality. Why not? So he does both. Spirituality and science. Mathematics for him. But it could be anything for you. All right. Now before I, and then he says, Tad jnanam samyak jnanam. This is complete knowledge, final knowledge, ultimate knowledge. Iti matam, this is my purport. This is the point I wanted to make. Who's saying this? Krishna is saying this. And Shankaracharya explains, Mama, whose point? Who is saying this? Mama Ishwarasya Vishnoho. For, for me, Ishwara, Vishnu, God, Saguna Brahman. Let us not forget who is speaking. Shankara reminds us. Who is speaking in the Bhagavad Gita? God is speaking to man. One of our Swamis, Swami Bhaskareshwar Anandaji, who was in our Ramakrishna Mat Nagpur in India. So it, um, there I've seen the notes made by the monks when he would teach the Gita. So the first, in the first class, when he would start teaching the Bhagavad Gita, he would make some important observations. One of those observations, which I still remember, 
one of those observations was when you are studying the bhagavad gita never forget who is speaking not a pandit not a spiritual teacher not a philosopher it is god incarnation of god krishna who is speaking so with all the reverence we would have if god manifested right now before us and told us this is good for you listen to this carefully absorb it and practice it in your life with what great reverence we would receive and keep that knowledge listen to these classes that way that swami used to say and i have seen the notes taken down this is decades ago actually more yeah t- several like t- nearly a century ago now so those young monks used to write this down beautiful at the very beginning of the course he would say remember throughout the course whom are you listening to you're not listening to some random monk you're not listening to some philosopher some pandit uh, some scholar uh, some spiritual person not even that you're listening to sri krishna himself beautiful points i mean those really touches you another point he would make this is i'm talking about that swami and i found it in those notes written nearly a century ago another point he would make is whenever you listen to these talks on gita or any spiritual teaching keep there's a sanskrit word prayojanam my need my benefit why am i here he says keep this prayojanam vibrating within you i'm here because i need this he's talking to a group of monks you have given up everything in the world why why are you sitting here because this is why so imagine how alert we would be to listen to this these teachings if they say like nectar like words there's such pleasing words such uh, inspiring words such life giving words they make this the pillar to which you hold yours so such in su- such a way he would inspire the students for the ensuing course on bhagavad gita you know <laughs> all right before i wrap up let me just read the next part this is shankaracharya's explanation of the two verses done explanation finished the next 12 pages f- filled with dense arguments all of it is questions being raised uh, there are a lot of people who listen to this and with they, they have they come from various philosophical schools and they have various objections to this i say not so fast <laughs> uh, what is it called i'm going to rain on your parade <laughs> your non dualistic period i'm going to rain on it so shankaracharya will raise questions and then he will answer them uh, what's the point why should we dive into these subtle arguments which will follow now so because they will clarify our understanding of advaita there is a um, metaphor used in sanskrit sthuna nikandana nyaya a pole we are going to drive it into the ground like a pillar or a beam or a pole and drive it into the ground what do you do you drive it in you shake it and take it out a little bit and then drive it in deeper that shaking it little as if you're trying to take it out a little more why do you take it out a little more in order to drive it deeper why do you teach something and then raise skeptical doubts and questions and objections to it you to drive it in deeper that's what he's going to do i'm going to raise the question here and then stop and then so that you are eager to know the answers when he raises the question he will feel that yeah that's right all of this was wrong <laughs> it's all silliness <laughs> nonsense and the questions are powerful he raises a question i'll uh, read it out and translate nanu sarva kshetreshu eka eva ishvara na anya tad vyatirikta bhokta vidyate chet if you are claiming that in all fields there is only one knower of the field and there is only this one ishvara one god one consciousness other than that there is no other sentient being nothing separate from god nothing separate from pure consciousness if you're saying that then you are inviting a world of trouble for yourself listen uh, he says tataha in that case ishwarasya samsaritvam praptam in that case god will become a samsari will become a sentient if god is one with me i am this uh, miserable creature god becomes infected with the world then or ishwara vetirekena va samsarinah anyasya abhavat samsara abhavat prasanga or if you say that god does not become a samsari yeah. in that case and you are saying that there is no samsari no sentient being apart from god then there is no one in samsara then there is no samsara at all okay then what will happen 
तच्च उभयानिष्टम बोथ ऑप्शन आर नॉट अनएक्सेप्टेबल इधर यू आर रिड्यूसिंग गॉड टू द स्टेटस ऑफ एन ऑर्डिनरी मॉटल और यू आर सेइंग दिस ओनली गॉड एग्जिस्ट एंड नो मॉटल एग्जिस्ट्स बोथ आर अनएक्सेप्टेबल व्हाई बंद मोक्ष तदहेतु शास्त्र अनर्थक्य प्रसंगा ही सेज इन दैट केस ऑल ऑफ स्पिरिचुअलिटी इंक्लूडिंग योर प्रेशियस गीता उपनिषद वेदांत दे ऑल बिकम मीनिंगलेस नॉनसेंस इफ यू आर गॉड डू यू नीड एनी वेदांत डज गॉड नीड वेदांत डज गॉड नीड टू मेडिटेट डज गॉड नीड टू डू कर्म योग no then all these teachings who are they meant for if you if i am god clearly you don't, i don't need these teachings <laughs> so what is the point of all religion and spirituality then shastra anarthakya prasanga all scriptures become meaningless in that case nonsense and then pratyakshadi pramana virodhaccha and what you are saying finally completely most important it completely contradicts our experience so this is why we object to advaita vedanta my direct experience is i am this little fellow no matter what you say limitless consciousness whole world is an appearance in who knows sound sounds nice but i still have to face uh, lincoln tunnel traffic going back to her home in, in, in new jersey uh, uh, or i have to go back in the subway right now after this and face what's tomorrow Saturday said it's good <laughs> but then monday is coming up soon so pratyaksha virodha it's directly runs contrary your non dualism directly runs contrary to my direct daily experience every day's experience is this world you are denying it all and then he explains further pratyakshena tavat sukha dukha tad hetu lakshana samsara upalabhyate direct experience shows me a world full of pain and suffering and yes pleasure seeking and some amount of pleasure also sukha dukha lakshana and that is produced by samsara a world exists out there that's what's giving me pain and pleasure and all of that and logically also jagat vaichitra because of this tremendous diversity in the world somebody is doing very well in life somebody is utterly miserable somebody is very healthy somebody is dying of sickness um, some Uh, are born rich some struggle in poverty uh, some are born with perfect health and tremendous mental power and uh, others are born with a, uh, you know a crippled body and a retarded brain uh, why now in vedanta you don't attribute this to god because if you attribute this to god god will become um, what is called vaishamya dosha uh, will be, become infected with the defect of partiality God is not responsible for our sufferings. Indirectly, yes, but directly, no. Directly, what is responsible? Karma. Yeah. So he says, "Jagat vaichitra upalabdhe." When you see the diversity of life experiences in this world, jagat, dharma dharma nimitta samsara numiyate. A samsara born of karma, good and evil, is inferred. So the law of karma is to be inferred here. This tremendous diversity, not due to God. ups and downs not due to god it's due to karma karma means good karma and bad karma what is good karma when you deliberately make an effort when we try to make an effort to be moral ethical it's called dharma when we deliberately are mischievous naughty it's called adharma the result of dharma is good karma in sanskrit punya merit and the result of this merit is sukha happiness pleasure worldly kind the ordinary kind of happiness and also otherworldly heavenly kind of happiness and the result of adharma mischief is uh, papa demerit sin and the result of sin is unhappiness dukkha so now you know when you grumble <laughs> why is this so bad so our mixture of good and bad which we get are the results of our past karma so this is general the basic the simple version of the law of karma which is then the very fact that we are experiencing the diversity leads us to infer there must be some causal factor behind these diversities you can't attribute partiality to god who is supposed to be perfect and generally a very nice guy <laughs> so uh, you cannot attribute it to god so it must be karma it must be good and bad karma that means samsara is there there are sentient beings how is karma doesn't float in the air there are sentient beings who are struggling in life going up and down in life becoming better becoming worse and going through this cycle um, so there is samsara 
for all of these reasons. Basically, he has given four major, ob um, if you split up these objections, four major ob objections. If you say that, that, that Krishna alone is all the conscious beings, is one consciousness everywhere, then you are saying God is a sentient being like me, an, in, an individual being subject to samsara imperfection. God is no longer God. That's one option. If you say, no, 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 God is perfect and we are all one with God, then we are not sentient beings. We are one with God. We are perfect consciousness. There is no sentient being left in this universe. Then this universe, this samsara wouldn't exist. Um, third, all your Vedanta becomes useless. Every spiritual teaching becomes useless if you hold on to this absurd doctrine of non-duality. Fourth, uh, most important, it just runs contrary to my daily experience. Four powerful objections. And Shankara's answer is cryptic. Of only one phrase he says. He says, No, no, nope. <laughs> I re summarily reject, summarily reject all of your objections. Why? Please explain. Jnana, jnana yo anyatve no papattehe. Because difference between, there is a difference between knowledge and ignorance. The effects of knowledge and the effects of ignorance. And that will explain all of it. What do you mean? We'll see. <laughs> Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanamastu. Then let the basket go around. If you have a question, somebody make an. The gentleman there at the back, please give him a microphone. Straight at the back, yes. Keep raising your hand so that our volunteers can come to you with the microphone. Yes. If there's a problem with the microphone, I can, no, I don't, I don't know. I can, you can just shout out your question, I'll repeat it. Tell us your name and ask the question. Go ahead, I can hear you. My name is Arvind. Yes. Um, what you said really struck a chord when you talked about how the Vaita should be a, how it's a metaphor, but a powerful metaphor to build a bridge to a reality, and similarly science can also be that. Yes. Come on Tuesday, a much better person than me we, we can answer that. Oh, can you, really, I mean it. Um, I, I'll just say something that Vivekananda said, and this is reported by Sister Nivedita in her introduction to the complete works of Swami Vivekananda. She says, Sister Nivedita says about Vivekananda, which is our master, that is Vivekananda, told us that science, art, and religion are three ways of getting that same realization. We normally think this is religion. By religion he means the spiritual teachings. So the spiritual paths are the ways of becoming enlightened. But Vivekananda went so far as to say even science can be a way of enlightenment and art can be a way of enlightenment. But then he added, uh, Sister Nivedita says, he added, but you need Advaita to understand this, non-duality to understand this. How can science lead to enlightenment? How can art lead to enlightenment? Not automatically. Even religion doesn't lead to enlightenment automatically. But how can it? And Vivekananda says, again cryptically, you need non-duality to understand this. Uh, Alright, I'll just leave it there. But you ask a much better person than me to, uh, about this. And he's doing it. Uh, the, the Swami is going to come and speak on Tuesday. He is a cutting-edge scientist, a mathematician, and a monk and a spiritual seeker. Uh, the gentleman there, can you pass the microphone? To, uh, is it working? No. Then just ask the question. Yeah. Yes. Uh, especially if I connect it to life and death and the karma. Yes. As a, as a person, I can see myself distinct from like realized enlightened people like Shankara, Ramakrishna, others. So it almost feels like I'm on a journey to that destination. Yes. And therefore, intrinsically, I'm separate. Yes. So, uh, please sit. So, Nil is saying that, you know, to say that I am one with Brahman, you know, I feel that I'm dis different from enlightened beings like, you know, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, Shankara. I can clearly see the difference between myself and them. 
and it feels like i am on a even if i'm spiritual i'm on a journey towards them how can i be one how how, how can non duality be be true but remember what shankara said just now what would shankara say it makes sense when you understand the difference between jnana agyana yoho anyatve na upapatte that's all he said if you understand the difference between knowledge and ignorance between becoming enlightened and not being enlightened then you will you would uh, see how it works how it in what sense are you the same as ramakrishna vivekananda ramana shankara how am i the same how are you the same and advaita vedanta says you are you are not only that you are the same as krishna and um, you know um, rama and buddha and you are same as vishnu and <laughs> you know god in heaven how but for that you have to go through that process that process of the first step is to see that i am not body not mind i am limitless consciousness who is one with um, brahman who is one with ramakrishna vivekananda not sunil you are right if you say that sunil is one with uh, with uh, an uh, enlightened being and you say it will be it's honest to say no i am not there i am not that at all i am very different from that but then what vedanta does is first deconstruct sunil who or what is sunil isn't that what's done in this step one is sunil this body is sunil this mind then you go beyond this body and mind and notice that you are the awareness to which body mind appears that awareness is it any more sunil is it a person any more is pure awareness witness consciousness is it a person or is it something impersonal what do you think is it a person is it one being limited being or is it something impersonal it's an impersonal principle mm-hmm. and what is ramakrishna or krishna and they are that same impersonal principle that same pure consciousness with the mind with the personality of ramakrishna which is tremendously different from your personality or my personality that that we agree so in first you have to go through the process of the deconstruction the inquiry and the what is self and what is not self if you do not inquire if you just take ourselves as we feel i am sunil and now how am i one with god you're not that's not what advaita is saying first we must do the self not self atma anatma vichara inquiry then we will arrive at pure consciousness then we will see everybody else is also the same pure consciousness see in another way as long as i see myself as a body you are all bodies to me when i see myself as a person you are all persons to me when i see myself as the awareness which illumines this body this person then i will see all of you as awareness also there is a saying that deva bhutva devam yajet worship the divine by being becoming divine whenever you see yourself as body physical everybody else and everything is physical to you see yourself as mental everybody else is a, a person to you personality to you but you see yourself as the spirit everything becomes the spirit to you not as a rhetoric just as a fact um yes can you uh, yes the gentleman please please tell us your name is it working now yeah, yeah. hi my name is srinivas pranam swami ji um so i get the part about you are not your body um i think i'm there uh I also get the part about you're not your mind at least I see the dichotomy between the awareness on one side of the chasm and then the mind itself yes. on the other side of the chasm and the mind is almost like a TV that's flipping its own channels I mean oh. you can actually observe that yes uh, the part I struggle with is if you look at the mind part it's so much more interesting it's the source of all artistry uh, art appreciation all relationships etc everything positive yes but if you look at the awareness side of it and I know you've said that you cannot uh, examine Objectify it. you cannot uh, uh, examine awareness but uh, it looks very monochromatic very yes. uniform and very u- unitarian yes so i still am not uh, able to associate this monochromatic part as the uh, the real you as opposed to say the mind right so the mind is interesting body is also interesting and so is the world <laughs> and brahman atman seems very boring just one witness please sit one witness consciousness it just seems what after all you are yourself saying it's only consciousness nothing else remember we that's the beauty of advaita vedanta they are not asking us to sacrifice the mind or the body or the world 
to shut out the world, to shut out the body, to shut down the mind. That is yogic meditation. And that is a person that that, that has a, a purpose also. To attain enlightenment, you need to shut down the activity of the mind and the senses so that you see that you are you are the witness of that. That is the yogi yoga chitta vritti nirodha. That, that that thing is there. But Advaita Vedanta doesn't say that. He says as as much fun with the mind and the um, and with the act with the body in the world, do good things, great things. All of it is accepted and indeed even expected. Jivan Mukta is somebody who is an amazing person. It is a blessing to himself or herself and is a blessing to everybody else in society. What the problem is this? We, the mind is fascinating. So are the senses and the body and the world. But the thing is we have situated ourselves in the middle of the mind. We have forgotten our nature as witness consciousness. And situating ourselves in the middle of the mind as the mind and the body. The mind is a wonderful servant, terrible master. So if the self, who am I? I am here and this mind is who I am, this body is who I am and this world is separate from me. You are asking for trouble. Then it's samsara starts. But on the other hand, knowing yourself to be this witness consciousness and then acting through mind and body, the wonderful mind with all its art and science. I just said, you can do art, you can do science. In fact, some of the greatest artists and some of the scientists were also very spiritual people. So, you can do that. It does not prevent you. In fact, all the beauty of the world, all the amazing possibilities of body, of the world, and the wonderful things in the mind, they are most useful to the enlightened one. Always concerned with what was there before birth and what is I don't believe in all this. I believe in squeezing the orange, dry, getting every drop out of it. Yeah. Then Vivekananda said, I too believe that. And then he said, in, only in my case the choice of fruit is different. I prefer a mango. <laughs> and then he says, imagine that if I knew that I, I cannot die, then I would not be in a hurry. I would you know, go through this world with so much peace and fearlessness. Imagine the joy of knowing that you and everybody else is one with God. Literally what Krishna was saying now. One with God is one with that pure consciousness. Then with what great joy you would engage with the world. And then Vivekananda told Ingersoll, squeeze your um, fruit, your orange uh, of the life in this way. Get 10,000 fold more. Get every last drop. Advaita is a better way of living in this very life. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to live in this life and be fearless in this life? Wouldn't you want to live in this life and take time to appreciate everything in this life? Hmm. Not live lives of quiet desperation. Hmm. We run through life as if chased by a hound. No. No. No fear. Fearless life. Direct result of Advaita is fearlessness. Vivekananda... Often would get late in time. I w um, I'm also running out of. I've run out of time. <laughs> we get late. One um, American lady tried to hurry him up. Swami, the talk is about to start. Please hurry up. Vivekananda looked at her in one of those typical Vivekananda looks and this tremendous majesty. You know, he said, "Madam, you live in time. I live in eternity." <laughs> of course, nothing is going to happen until he comes on stage. So. <laughs> That also is there. Then, yes, but it's a good question. Remember, nothing is sacrificed in this world if you take up Advaita Vedanta. It's not that you'll suddenly become a very boring Atman. What happened? You were very interesting earlier. No, I've become non-dual now. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You just have to look at people like Vivekananda, uh, Ramakrishna, Maharsharada, uh, uh, Ramana Maharshi and all. They're very interesting people. And people would be fascinated by Krishna. Is the most interesting person in all of history, I think. Was he boring? Not at all. He is teaking the same thing. Kshetra Gyam Chapi Maam Vidhi Sarva Kshetra Shubharata. Alright. One, one more question. Is there somebody else? There's two questions. We'll finish quickly. Um, Pranam Swamiji. Uh, my name is Prasoon. I have two questions. Um, my first question is, how does the nature of Atma... Uh, differ from positive feelings 
when you know you mentioned that we aren't the feelings of the mind such yes. as like an- ananda yes so how is that different than or how is ananda different from the positive uh, feelings so you get a feeling of joy euphoria well-being huh? and uh, how is that well-being different from the uh, atman uh, the after all did right today we talk about atman as pure consciousness but also atman is pure bliss pure joy yeah wellness how is it different from wellness so i was reading nyu just a little while ago sent out a circular and they had they said they have assured all of the people in nyu that um please don't worry our wellness center is available 24 by 7 if you were scared by the earthquake you can talk to us <laughs> yes yes it's it's an official circular so wellness how is it different how is atman different from the wellness So the answer to this don't forget your second question huh? uh, the answer to this is this Shankaracharya again he said what is this pure consciousness in itself it cannot be described by any word like manifest unmanifest cause effect see when you say atman is sat being we don't mean it's a th- existing thing it is existence itself what's an existing thing the book is an existing thing table is an existing thing human body is an existing thing but atman is not one more existing thing so when you say atman is sat being existence it means atman is existence itself what that means full lecture is required <laughs> similarly consciousness when you say atman is consciousness pure consciousness it's not what is meant by, in, by consciousness in consciousness studies what is meant by consciousness normally in our day to day when you're thinking listening you're thinking right now when is he going to finish that's Uh, that's consciousness plus mind already but consciousness by itself is not a conscious experience the consciousness is that which makes all conscious experiences possible existence is that which makes all existing things possible it's like the relationship between moonlight and sunlight so at night everything is illumined by moonlight and moonlight is not sunlight and yet it is sunlight it's not quite sunlight but it's also sunlight without one thing is sure without sunlight no moonlight would be possible similarly without pure consciousness no conscious experience would be possible without pure being sat nothing would exist in this universe now you extend that to ananda ananda is not a positive feeling nor is it a negative feeling but all fulfillment all positivity all overcoming of sorrow and attainment of happiness all of that is made possible because the nature of the self is ananda yeah. yes okay. second question yeah um this is related to last week's lecture but uh we keep talking about tattva masi yes how and we've been talking also about the dwait uh interpretation so how does some of the dwait background interpret tattva masi so remember what we are doing here is from the advaitic perspective and that's our home tradition that's what i teach also so we have not been talking about the dwait i have mentioned the dwaita background uh, the dwaita philosophy or the vishishta dwaita philosophy but we have not talked about it in detail those are very profound very internally coherent systems yeah. very well argued out with a vast literature of their own well, how would they see tattva masi first of all they wouldn't for them tattva masi you are that i am brahman these are not important statements they have different ways of explaining it or explaining it away as we will say but they are they are not the point of their te- uh, in advaita vedanta the whole point of vedantic teachings is tattva masi aham brahmasmi this is but from their perspective the dualistic perspective that's not the point at all but anyway if you press them how will you explain tattva masi so um, ramanuja would say tasya tvamasi sanskrit grammar will support that uh, interpretation also tattvam if you as if you split it up if you take directly you are that but suppose you don't want to take it directly you want to say that no you are not that obviously you are not brahman uh, but you are a part of that you belong to that you belong to god you are a part of god tasya tvamasi that can also work and that's what uh, the qualified monists will want to say and the no, and the dualist dvaita vedantins they um, go a little further they say tattva masi means atattva masi you are not that and they have a way of arguing that also all right last question yes. 
Vikas. Yes, we can do. My name is Vikas. I'll ask one of many questions that have been keeping me up at night. Um, is it possible that sometimes being aware of things or being conscious of things works against us? Because as children, we do our duty, we don't think about the result. And then when we grow up, we are told, do your duty, don't think about the result. But the fact that we are told that attaches us even more to the result and it works against us. So is it better to not know it? And if we know it, how do we make sure that it does not? Yeah, knowledge is always welcome. Knowledge is always welcome because our, our seeking the results of action, for example, are having various kinds of desires, are having various kinds of vasanas. And these are tendencies which have been carried over from earlier lives. It doesn't help not to know it. Knowledge is a curative. Now, you might say, but knowledge just reveals something which is difficult and dangerous or bad about it and might even intensify it. That's what you're saying. Yes, uh, in the case of purifying the mind, concentrating the mind, changing our life, it's not just knowledge, knowledge plus implementing it, living it, that struggle. So making a change anywhere in the body, in my life, in my thinking, in my feelings, that requires practice. And th this kind of teaching, what Krishna is teaching us, gives us a lot of insight. And we see in this chapters ahead, when he's talking about sattva, rajas, tamas, gives us a lot of insight about the constitution of our minds, of our characters. And gives us, that knowledge helps us to unlock these problems, you know, these cut the Gordian knot as it were, and um, work towards transforming our characters, our minds. So knowledge is always welcome. It's always good to know. Otherwise, without knowing, we'll rush into the world and we'll start working for results. <laughs> and then we'll get hurt when we, our results are not up to our expectations. Our expectations are always unrealistic, completely not related to either the world or our own past karma. <laughs> Knowledge helps us there, definitely. Okay, a bonus question. Pranam Swamiji, I'm Rajeshwari from Florida. I have been following you only on YouTube. Today is the first time in person. I was in Florida until I know, yes, yesterday. But I, uh, so I you have followed me from Florida also. <laughs> well, I could not come there. I was planning, but my husband had some health issues, so we are at Mount Sinai. Oh, and uh, my question now is, when we are sitting here, when you are talking, it says, okay, we have to consider the entire world as a Kshetra. Hmm. You know, wha everything we see and whatever we do. But in real life, when you go, you know, I'm a pediatrician. I have these parents who come with these children with multiple yes. deformities and all. Yes. Medically, I'm counseling, but deep inside, I'm thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to tell her this is God? Even for my own, like I have a niece with a severely disabled child. All right. Uh, besides now, giving love, what can we do yes, there? Yes, yes. Giving love and being understanding. Often people know somewhere inside when a situation is unchangeable. But it always helps to have a loving heart next to you. And, you know, uh, especially if a doctor can set up a kind of, of sympathy, empathic relationship. Uh, it can be done. It, it's a mat matter of seconds. It doesn't take too long also. It's often, you see, you like a person immediately or dislike a person immediately. It doesn't take too long. So it can be done very quickly. And that's the first thing. The attitude of service. The Lord has come to my office in this form. I shall serve the Lord, Lord to the best of my ability. If I cannot do anything at all, at least, um, you know, a, a smile and a kind word and encouraging word. Hmm? But then, you see, f now, from the non-dual knowledge, from the spiritual knowledge, see how useful it is. What we just said, that I am not the body. What, what I just said a little while ago, I am that one perfect pure consciousness, doesn't matter what kind of uh, body, it might be um, uh, undeveloped, it might be sick, broken, retarded, whatever is it, even the mind. Somebody asked me, how can this non-dual knowledge help a person who is uh, mentally ill, a schizophrenic person or um, you know, somebody suffering from acute depression, it is of great help if it's done properly. It's like a, you know, this, you have got um, CBT. Cognitive behavior therapy. Huh? So this is more like, a, I, I sometimes joke, this is, uh, don't take it otherwise, this is like CBT on steroids. <laughs> it is tremendously powerful. It is showing you an existing side to yourself. 
a dimension, a spiritual dimension of yourself which is already there. It's already there. A source of fearlessness, of peace. That w whatever happens, that spiritual nature of mine, that's always perfect and it's always available to me and it's always there. And this is like a two minutes show. Even the most damaged body, even the most devastated mind. It's great if you are very healthy, if you're great if you're highly educated, if you're great if you have a fine mind and many talents. That's wonderful, we are happy for you. But even if we don't, there's nothing to feel ter so terrible about. You'll feel bad, but there's nothing to feel so terrible about. There is something within us, you know, uh, which um, I'll paraphrase Mark Twain and end there. Mark Twain, he went to India and he wrote after coming back, he wrote in his uh, journey uh, uh, across, uh, journey across the uh, uh, journey on the, uh, along the equator or something. Uh, so when he went to India, he wrote, in the world of religion in the world of spirituality there is only one millionaire and that's India in the world of spirituality we are all millionaires billionaires and it's not rhetoric it's not something you know say as positive affirmation Vedanta claims you can come to see it yeah, through careful observation and the way the technique that has been given you can come to see our own immortal nature our own pure nature yeah. far beyond name and form is Atman ever free Vivekananda says, far beyond name and form, body and mind, is Atman ever free. Know thou art that sannyasi bold. Say Om Tat Sat Om. Very good.